All right, fools. It is just a little bit past two o'clock here on the East Coast. And this is our Million Acres Hour, where we talk about all things real estate. And this week, we're going to talk a little bit about volatility and how real estate is... uh, how real estate compares to the stock market in some ways and how it can kind of help you uh, balance out some of those nerves that you might be having in recent weeks. So I'm oh. here with Matt, Agers- Matt Argersinger. So please. Hello. Yeah, let's get, let's get going, Deidre. I'll uh, share the screen here because we've got a few slides to share as, as usual. So there is... There's our t- typical Million Acres logo here, and, and you can see, uh, you know, follow Deidre and me on Twitter. Um, as I like to say, Deidre's still much more entertaining follow <laughs> on Twitter and elsewhere. But yeah, let's talk about, well, before we get into sort of the volatility, you know, you and I always like to kind of see where the market is mm-hmm. uh, these days. And, uh, you know, we've only got a couple, well, about a, a day or so left in the uh, first quarter here. And it's actually been a pretty good first quarter for real estate um, and for the market in general. You can see the S&P 500 is up. Uh, 6%, definitely a nice gain for three months. Uh, although, of course, as always, there's feels like there's been a ton in between that, right? I mean, I, I was just thinking about, I was writing an article earlier today and I was reflecting on, gosh, we had sort of the uh, the capital riots. We had, we had the uh, the Texas winter storm, DJ, if you remember that. Uh, we had, uh, you know, we had the, the Reddit GameStop craze. And then we also, gosh, we just had the Suez Canal, which was blocked for almost a week. So mm-hmm. think about all the things that have happened. Yeah, and here we are. S&P tornadoes. 500. Oh, tornadoes. Oh, yeah. Weather has been all over the place. And uh, here we are. S&P 500 is up 6%. It's like nothing happened. I mean, it's been great. Um, interesting, though, NASDAQ 100, I like to point to this only because it's been such a champion of the stock market for, you know, gosh, this whole bull market really going back more than 10 years. But uh, that's that's seen a lot more volatility as it usually does. And Kind of interesting to see that it's barely changed so far this year. I'm just up a little bit. Uh, but here we go with real estate. Vanguard Real Estate ETF, that's the, the uh, VNQ ETF that I always look, look at for kind of benchmark where the real estate market is. That's enjoying a really nice start to the year, up more than 9%. Uh, and humble bragging, of course, always allowed here. I like to include where some of our premium uh, million acres services are doing. Our average real estate winner's recommendations up 8.7% so far this year. Trailing the VNQ, I'm not happy about that, but it's it's definitely ahead of the, the market. And then our average mogul recommendation, which also does REITs and equity recommendations in addition to private real estate deal recommendations is up uh, even better. So, so far a good year to real estate. Is it playing out the way you would ex- you'd expected the year to go so far, Deidre? I think it's playing out a little more uh, optimistically than I had thought in terms of reopenings and things like that, you know, seeing uh, conferences being booked, seeing, you know, we talked before uh, about Comic-Con, that's now happening around Thanksgiving. Yes, yes. So I'm actually, you know, kind of pleasantly surprised by how fast things are rolling out. Yeah, well, that, and that's good. It, it kind of going, going hand in hand with the vaccines. And uh, you mentioned Comic-Con. Yeah, there was actually a rumor uh, a few weeks ago that they were actually going to have the Comic-Con on time in July in San Diego, reduced numbers and all that. But, um, but they've uh, you know, wi- probably wisely decided to push that off several more months. So it's now going to be happening uh, in Thanksgiving, which is actually causing a lot of chagrin among typical Comic-Con uh, attendees for a lot yeah. of reasons, but maybe not a great time of year. Anyway, we'll, 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 we won't digress there. So let's go, let's talk a little bit about um, volatility. I'm glad we're, we're on this subject because it is something that, gosh, certainly lately in the stock market, we've experienced, gosh, 2020 was one of the most volatile years uh, in the stock market, down and up, that we've ever seen. And, but you know, Deidre, we, we tend to think about real estate as a little more of a safe haven. Uh, you know, it certainly wasn't the case last year, but over time, it certainly f- is that asset class that we at least look to, has, to experience less volatility over time. Absolutely. And, you know, just a little bit about volatility is, you know, I think long-term investors are perhaps better equipped to deal with it. We've, you know, as you age, you've been through a few market cycles. I remember the first time the market, you know, really dropped and I like panicked. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to lose everything. But once you've been through a few cycles, you, you get, you get a little, a little used to things and you know, especially if when you look at the research that over time, your money will, you know, it will come back, it will increase 
but, but volatility makes people nervous. Uh, I mean, the press covers it sort of incessantly when it starts to happen. You see all oh, yeah. those like Getty images of the traders with their head in their hands. They look you know. stressed, the red sweat beads <laughs> coming down. The, yeah, totally. Uh, no, I, I love your point because the more you deal with, the more you experience volatility, the longer you're an investor, hopefully you get a little more, you know, steeled to a lot of these, uh, these events that happen in the market from time to time. And uh, you kind of maybe think of an old David Gardner adage, which is uh, the stock market falls faster on the way down, but it always rises more over time. It's that it, it rises slower over time, um, but we feel that downside volatility uh, so much more. And I think the biggest problem with volatility is not so much that it happens. We know that volatility happens. It's right. the stock market has been volatile throughout history. It's how people react to it. Um, you know, what, how, what is the emotional fortitude? Because if you look at our second bullet point here, you know, what happens to a lot of people is, especially those who haven't really been investing for a long time, you know, they see it, the stock market down 15, 20%. They see maybe some of their stock holdings down 30, 40, even 50%. And it's a really uncomfortable feeling to, to be losing uh, money that you've, you know, worked hard for and that you're investing and saving for the future. And so a lot of people will panic and, and often pu- you know, push the sell button just because they can't stand losing anymore. And they're just worried. And as you mentioned, the headlines are bad. The media is covering it. We're probably covering it a little bit in the Motley Fool, a million acres. Mm-hmm. What can we say, you know, when things are volatile and it, you know, it, it gets, it gets to a lot of people. And, and that's, you know, of course, what we try to preach here in, in million acres and the Motley Fool is just, uh, gosh, if you're in, if you're an investor, you're by definition, a long-term investor, and you understand that the stock market day to day, month to month, year to year even is not, you know, usually a good indication of a, a company's value. Um, that's determined over time. And as long as you're invested in the right companies, eh, who cares if the market's so volatile? Um, you know, and, and pointing to another bullet here, you know, can, volatility can indicate an overall market instability. Yeah, it, I, but not, you're right, but not always because sometimes things happen in the market. You know, this past week, there was a, uh, uh, a deleveraging or a liquidation of a, a massive institutional fund that happens to own a lot of big stocks in the US, Europe, and, and China. And just by that, that fund liquidating, you saw a company like Viacom CBS, which is a blue chip media company, you know, market cap over 100 billion. It got cut in half. Uh, now, is that, do we think CBS's business suddenly is worth half? You know, today as it was, you know, a few weeks ago, probably not, but the stock market made it so because this fund happened to be liquidating their holdings and was sort of forced to do that because of margin calls and, and, and delevering. Uh, so it, it, there's just a lot of things that can happen in the market that, you know, don't necessarily indicate any fundamental problems or uh, an overall instability with the system. It's just things happen. Institutions moving in and out of stocks or uh, a hedge fund blows up, <laughs> which they seem to blow up all the time. So, um, so saying all this though, if, if volatility doesn't really matter, if it doesn't really equal risk, um, should it even matter to the long-term investor? I think that's a that's a that's a interesting question to ask investors. And so I like what we have on this next slide, which is, which would you rather have? Would you rather have an investment that returns nine percent a year with a five percent standard deviation? So in other words, it kind of swings five percent around its mean. Or would you want one that returns 11% a year, which is a lot better, especially over time, but that can swing wildly with like a 25% standard deviation? Now, investment B is probably more typical of your average stock. Mm-hmm. You know, your average stock go, probably goes up about 11% year, uh, per year over time, but it can swing pretty wildly, oftentimes 20% or more in any given year. So uh, what do you think, teacher? What, which one do you, are you leaning towards? Uh, I say, why choose? I think have, have both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you can have, okay, of course, you can have both. But let's pretend you're in a world and you, this is all you got. For the next 10 years, you either choose investment A or you choose investment B. Which one do you think? No right or wrong answers. Right. I mean, I've, I, I, in my life, I've tended to go with B, but the older I get, the more I, I like A because I get, ah. you know, we all get a little, we all get a little more nervous. I think maybe as we age, we all get close a to retirement. Less, I get yeah. it. Okay. What, what's fascinating is this. I think a lot of investors would think, well, if I don't care about volatility, I don't care what the standard deviation is doing. Let me just right. choose 11% per year. But what you'll find is that in a normal distribution, we can talk about that some other time, but in a normal distribution, this is what happens. 
actually. Investment A, because of that lower standard deviation, actually compounds at a greater rate, a 1% percentage point per year greater rate than investment B, purely because of the volatility is much lower. If you think about it, what's happening to investment B in a normal distribution is that there's, there's, you know, there's years where it's down 15%, there's years where it's up 30%. Um, but because of the, that's happening, the investment has to, you know, if, if think about it, if a stock drops 10%, well, it doesn't have to go up 10% to get back to, uh, to even, it's going to go up more than 10%. And so that has a, a, an effect. And so we end up with a geometric mean, a geometric return that's a lot different. And so it turns out, believe it or not, investment A with the lower uh, returning per year, but lower volatility is actually the better investment. So if you invest at 100%, you know, compounding at 8.875%, that's what you end up with in 25 years. Rather than investing 100,000 B, you end up with a pretty good return, but not nearly as good as uh, investment A. So this is just a math- mathematical way of looking at what, how volatility can, can have an impact on um, a portfolio's returns. And so it's wise if you think, you know, to not totally ignore volatility. Um, you know, generally we're looking for the, the, the highest returning investment, again, especially if you're a long-term investor and you can, you can live with the sort of the swings, uh, ebbs and flows of the stock market. But volatility is not meaningless. It certainly has an effect on your returns. And so here we go, Deidre, this is our favorite topic, of course, real estate. And so why are we we talking about real estate today? Well, because real estate is an asset class that over time has been less volatile than the average stock. If you look at the average REIT, uh, real estate investor trust, or even just sort of any of your, your kind of real estate companies that might not be REITs, their volatility over time is not nearly as high um, as the average stock. And if, if we step outside the stock market, it gets even better if you look at, for example, um, the, the NACREF index, you know, which is national, it's an index of, of commercial properties, but it's, it's been tracked for decades. Uh, very, not, very uncorrelated with the stock and, and bond markets, um, very low volatility. It has about a third of the volatility uh, of the stock market. And so real estate in general, um, it's, it's a fantastic asset class, we think, because not only does it generate great returns, um, but it also comes with much lower volatility. One other thing too, you know, as we talk about REITs and real estate in general, is that because real estate REITs, real estate management companies, you know, what, what you're essentially dealing with are long-term leases, 5, 10, 15-year leases. Even at the multifamily level, you know, you've got, a, you know, let's say, uh, you know, if you've got a high occupancy apartment building, You've got tenants who might be on six month to one year leases or even month to month leases, but it's all very staggered. And so you have a very predictable, predictable view of your cash flows, uh, you know, year to year. And that way, you know, not only does it make the business stable, it also lets uh, REITs and real estate companies provide steady and consistent dividends and distributions. Uh, so it's, a, it's an asset class with a lot of advantages. You know, we, we won't, for example, talk about the tax advantages, but real estate also has many tax advantages versus uh, other asset classes. And so all these things really lead to an asset class that by and large, much more stable, much more consistent, less volatile over time. Absolutely. I think that uh, I think that some people right now are looking at REITs uh, in the moment or comparing it to last year, and that's it's such a it's such oh, yeah. an anomalous year. It's got nothing to do with the long term history of REITs. If you look at REITs over time, you know it's just it's just so clear. And we've got some great research on Million Acres about this that I can that I can throw in the chat as well because it really just real estate just holds its value over time and steadily increases. Yeah, and. Another thing about real estate too, um, just getting on the tax, is that uh, real estate's often held um, by people for a long time. Obviously, because a it's illiquid, and so that that's often viewed as a negative, right? Well, real estate's illiquid, but uh, but because it's that way, you know, it's not as if I, you know if I own a commercial building or if I own a uh, a rental property, I'm checking the value of that thing every day. Now I might get you know, the case Schiller index comes out or, or I get my zest, zestimate on Zillow and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay. But I'm not, I'm not checking that like the stock market on a day to day or week to week basis. And 
even if my, you know, even if my property appreciates and I'm excited about that, uh, it's not like I can go out tomorrow and sell it and realize that, that equity. Well, in this market, you probably could. But. Well, that's true. I mean, this is unusual. Everyone's buying houses these days. And, and of course, with the rise of I buying, man, there is a lot more liquidity, quote unquote, in, in the housing market. But it's still that asset class where people are, are kind of forced into holding it for long periods of time. And in a way that uh, indirectly causes it to be more stable because real estate's just not transacted um, as often as, as they're given stock, which is you know, traded every second, even every microsecond uh, every day in the stock market when it's open. So one of the things that's uh, obviously been a hot topic, Deidre, lately is interest rates. Mm-hmm. We've seen the yields on the treasury bonds rise. Uh, that's interesting only because it kind of, it's juxtaposed with the, the Fed saying, hey, we're not raising rates. You know, our intention is to keep rates low for the next couple of years, but you've had the situation where, yeah, if you look at the ten-year bond, it's uh, it's up quite a bit over the last several months. Uh, not quite back to where it was before COVID and all that, but it's it's risen pretty dramatically from where it was, say, last summer, and that's caused a little bit of consternation in, in the stock market. Absolutely, and there's a lot of discussion lately about inflation. Uh, you know, one of the things that with with Janet Yellen in as Treasury Secretary, there's a lot of discussion on how much. Uh, of a cap they're going to put on inflation, if they're going to let inflation grow a little bit to kind of stimulate the economy. There's all sorts of discussion about that. Yeah. And inflation is one of those interesting topics when it comes to real estate. Real estate is a fairly good inflation hedge, at least it has been over time, uh, for the simple fact that the cost of building a house or a building rises over time. Uh, The labor to to construct a building uh, or a house over time has gone up. And so in, in a way, all else equal, uh, real estate kind of tends to rise with inflation. I mean, you know, by and large, you you should expect any property you own to rise by the amount of inflation as the replacement cost of that asset goes up over time. But I, you know, as we point out here, it's, it's not always great. I mean, there are, if, you know, if inflation rises faster than say, pretend, you know, for imagine a moment you're, you're a hospitality REIT and you're trying to raise your daily prices uh, for your rooms. I mean, yeah, you can react to that, um, but man, maybe my my cost, my food costs, my service costs, all that stuff are going up way faster, and I can't raise my hotel prices fast enough to to uh, to match demand in the market, and so therefore I I tend to lose because I'm more of a I'm more of an operating real estate business than say, uh, you know, a, an office REIT. But then if you do look at REITs um, general, like what a lot of REITs buildings are on long term leases. Well, it's not as if I can. You know, imagine I'm, I have a tenant who's on a five-year lease. I've got a uh, an escalator in there that raises the rent two to three percent per year. Maybe that doesn't keep up with inflation, and all of a sudden, uh, my rental income is is steady and growing, but it's not nearly keeping up with my my costs uh, in the market. And so, I think for all asset classes, real estate included, if inflation rises too fast and too high, uh, of course, it's going to damage uh, you know real estate just like any uh, just like most other asset classes. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're going to see a lot of attention on that, because that's something that, uh, that the, the, you know, that the Fed is watching, too. They don't want inflation to get out of control. There's a lot of, but they also need a certain amount of it. It's been at, at really low rates for a long period of time. And some people have said that that contributed to sort of that really, really slow recovery over the last couple, uh, last decade or so. Yeah, it's 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 possible because you know if you look at wages, wages have felt like they've stagnated, mm-hmm. uh, so incomes have sort of stagnated, and and you know and there's been tremendous de- deflationary pressures in other parts of the market. Whether you talk about uh, you know technology goods or apparel and things like that, and so uh, and that's 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 hurt profit margins in a lot of cases. And so yeah, a little inflation is probably good. Uh, what does what does a little inflation do? Also, by the way, it makes your debt service costs relatively cheaper over time too. And is because most of your debt's going to be fixed. You know, if you have interest payments and principal payments, well, you know, uh, little inflation, I'm getting more income elsewhere. The relative size of my debt is is declining. So that's also a, one of the reasons the Fed likes when inflation, when there's a little inflation in the market kind of helps the government and helps, uh, you know, essentially debt led and businesses out there as well. Uh, now you I, you added this bullet, which I think is interesting. So re, you know residential real estate prices. I mean, we saw another report today. Uh, mm-hmm. Year over year, Kate prices. Keller was out today. Yeah. Yeah, year over year prices up 
I was it 12 percent. It was or 11 percent. It was it was yeah. like low double digits. I mean, that's extraordinary. And a lot, you know, a lot of people, I think, rightfully so, are saying, "Gosh, is is the housing market in a bubble?" But you don't necessarily think that's the case. I don't. It's the supply is so low. There are now more agents than there are houses for sale. <laughs> so that that's just that's just a crazy statistic. I mean, the 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 amount of inventory it and it's not just in you know traditionally hot markets. It's everywhere, and it's yeah. it's really just doing some crazy things to the market. It's starting, I believe, to affect the sales numbers, but uh, we'll have to see what what the next month shows because we're getting right into that heart of selling season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the inventory. Listing. Yeah, the inventory. That's the thing. The inventory. It's no one's listing their house for sale. No one's really moving. Uh, and you know, I'm looking at reports from developers all the time. They're home builders. They're yeah, they're building as kind of fast as they can, but even they can't keep up with the demand. And by the way, they're seeing a lot of uh, you know higher uh, lumber, copper construction costs mm-hmm. going into their business. And so a lot of times they're holding back as well, thinking it's just, it's just not profitable enough for me to build new houses right now. So it's this weird market that we're in, where existing homes. Right. They just keep getting uh, priced higher just because there's so few of them. And the, the amount of time they're on the market keeps shrinking. Uh, and so, yeah, can you can you really call the, the you know housing market in a bubble? I, I don't think so. There's just so many different factors today versus, say, back in you know the mid 2000s. And by the way, um, if you've tried to buy a house or, or refinance a house lately, I try I refinanced a house lately or recently. And my goodness, the underwriting standards of today are much more stringent than they were uh, in the previous, well, two decades ago now. And so it's not as easy for people to to buy homes these days, or at least buy homes to the extent, you know, the, the, the value that they think they can get, um, because the, the underwriting standards uh, for lenders have gotten so strict. So gosh, like, it's just, you know, there's demand out there, but there's no one really selling. And, and the people who are able to buy, um, not only do they have, you know, a lower selection of homes to choose from. And so they're kind of buying and or getting into bidding wars. Um, but it's also just, it's really, it's really costly and expensive to get to try to buy a house uh, right now too, despite historically low interest rates. <laughs> it's true because I think that uh, before the pandemic, we saw a little bit of that loosening of underwriting, but then post pandemic, it, it kind of tightened right back up again. Banks are starting to get nervous. And the other factor too, is I feel like we're almost at the end of the refi boom. It seems like looking at the numbers from the Mortgage Bankers Association each week, it's, they're still, they're still big, but they're not as like massive as they were. So I feel like we're getting closer to the end of everybody who kind of got in and refied while the rates were low. May, there may not be that, you know, it may be kind of over for now to some extent. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to see how that plays out, especially if, if rates don't go back down again. Um, then you'd have to believe that the refi market is is pretty much plateaued. Uh, last bullet here. Yeah, people are seeking alternative stocks, um, but where are they going? Uh, you you say that you mentioned they're going to Bitcoin yeah. <laughs> as, as sort of the new gold um, instead of uh, other places. Is uh, what's what's called? Well, now now that? Bitcoin is looking stable compared to <laughs> NFTs, which really makes oh me gosh. nervous. So I think that I think that uh, the the fact that Bitcoin is being gradually more uh, accepted, more places, you know, and like things things like PayPal and Square using Bitcoin is giving it a little bit of legitimacy that may or may not be earned in terms of its actual stability long term, and that's that's the thing that worries me. Gold is actually down this year. Last I heard, by like nine percent, partly because it's no longer that you know you, you don't hear about the gold bugs as much as you used to. True. So for thousands of years, gold was sort of the ultimate store of value. Uh, mm-hmm. And now in 2021, it's, nah, forget gold. <laughs> <laughs> We've got newer things. We've got Bitcoin and, and digital unique assets that I don't quite understand that people are paying millions of dollars for. Uh, all right. Uh, love these uh, love these tables that Nari pulls, puts out. Um, quite a bit going on here. Uh, but Deidre, why, you want to walk us through this a little bit, this table? Well, the reason I like this table is that it shows, uh, you know, it really shows that what we were seeing with in terms of volatility uh, in the past year and how it, we're coming, kind of coming out of it now. Because if you look at those, you know, you've got the red things on the side and the black things in the middle. Well, the black things in the middle are, <sighs> you know, <laughs> it's sort of us kind of bouncing back. And the red thing is the red, the red, you know, 
when we're in yeah. the red is, you know, is the effect of the pandemic over time. But even amidst that, I mean, you look, I always like to look amidst that sea of red. There are those uh, the, the little black lines there. You know, what did well? Okay, industrial. Oh, yeah, right here. Know, single family homes, self yep. storage, which we talk about a lot. You know, yep. these data centers, these are the things that, that are less volatile in general. And that's one of the things as we look at, you know, REITs are less volatile in general, but within REITs too, there are some REITs that are less volatile than others based on, you know, based on, on a variety of factors. You know, you mentioned lease term, that's part of it. Uh, also just demand over time and those sort of demographic and economic tailwinds. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're all in here. Yeah. Which is, this is, I love how Narit set this up because right, right, right here, you have sort of the, the crash, right? The, the, the pandemic peak, so to speak of, well, of the volatility in the stock market from, you know, mm -hmm. last February to mid or late March. And this is just the absolute devastation you saw. Uh, retail got obviously pummeled, reached, look at malls down 62%. Yeah. Um, commercial financing, home financing really crushed. Uh, and then these, yeah, this shows sort of the bounce back, the huge rally we saw since from the end of March to the fall. And then, you know, this is your sort of recent performance, uh, this column. And then the final column is the whole, the whole gamut, basically, the, the, the year from February to February. Uh, and, you know, as devastating and crazy as this was, um, you know, year over year, granted, still a very bad year for real estate, historically bad. Uh, but gosh, these returns are a lot more sort of, I don't know. Uh, digestible, I guess. I don't know what the right word would be, but just survivable, right? Like if you said, okay, real estate's going to be, it's going to have a bad year. And these are some of the returns you'd be like, okay, I can, I can take that. I'll look for some bargains, but I, you know, that's not going to cause me to fall out of my chair. Um, but look what you had to go through. <laughs> you had to go through this. Uh, right. Is, but that's, but that is, it's sort of proof of the volatility thing that we were talking about. If you, if you were a REIT holder in one of these sectors and you, and you panicked at that, you know, Oh, during, during March 23rd. Moment. If you sold on March 23rd, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yes. if, yeah, you, you would. But if you hold on, okay, things are starting to get better. And in many of those cases, we're going to expect to see them continue to get better. So it really is that example of, you know, when you're at that low, you just have to, it's, it's almost like you have to lock your stocks away from yourself. Like, just don't, don't do it. Just yeah, you know, don't look, don't it's, look. It's so tempting. Don't look, don't, don't get in there. <laughs> Unless yeah. you're unless you're trying to to you know to buy something and even and even then you know you want to be careful about about what you're buying, but I mean I think there are a lot of us at at the fool who certainly when we see prices go low look, start looking at our watch lists and go well maybe. Yeah, exactly. Well, oh gosh, you could have. I mean, right? If you were buying in sort of late March last year. Mm -hmm. You're feeling pretty good. I mean, you know, if you, I was doing some buying, a lot of people were doing buying and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, thankfully we, we recommended some, some REITs and equities in our mogul service around that time, which all, have all done extraordinarily well. And that was because, you know, looking at things, you just saw uh, in a lot of cases that a lot of valuations were just so beaten down, uh, trading below, well below net asset value. Um, if you, if you thought there was any future of the, to the U.S. <laughs> and the economy, right. you know, in the next several years, you, you could have made some um, fantastic investments. Uh, but like, yeah, like you pointed out some of the ones that where there's a lot more stability, industri industrial, you mentioned. So as terrible as 2020 was, and, and the whole pandemic year was, um, it ended up higher um, than where it began, obvious reasons. E-commerce, you know, the, the, the sort of rise in the need and the demand for warehouse and distribution logistics. We talked a lot about that. I actually think this is a pretty, um, if you told me that we were going to pull sort of five years of e-commerce together, uh, you know, accelerate that forward in one year, which we kind of did in 2020, I think this number should actually be a lot higher. I think even though industrial is one of the few on here that has, has enjoyed a positive return, um, it's one of those still I view as, as actually really undervalued given what we know is the reality of, of the demand for e-commerce and, and going forward. And then, uh, yeah, single family homes, you know, positive. Again, such a huge demand for these. Um, they're just not enough. We're just not building enough. Uh, and then self-storage, um, always a very much more stable asset class within real estate. It's got a lot of advantages um, and tends to be, you know, if there's a panic in the streets, it's not like suddenly everyone's going to cl go clear out their self-storage and stop, you know, paying their $70 a month to you. 
to keep all their stuff because they'll lose all their stuff. So it's, it's, it's a very good business model in a lot of cases. What the heck has happened to timber? That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't understand commodities as well as a lot of other people. So that's just, that's just amazing to me. I mean, 91% off the bottom in, in timber REITs and wow, amazing. Uh, so anyway, a really cool look. I'm, I'm glad you brought this table in for today's slides because uh, it's, um, it is the year that was in the pandemic, right? And we're coming out of it. And gosh, look at this, you know, I know we've had, it's been pretty good market over the past month as well, but gosh, there's probably still some good bargains out there. And like I said, even though industrial, we're seeing, you know, a positive return there. I, I think we're still, we're, there's still plenty of bargains in, in that space, as you know, as I've sort of talked to you for <laughs> years about. Um, yeah. So here we go. Let's, let's look at this so chart, chart one pandemic air returns. Yeah. So this is just another sort of a linear yeah. measure of it. And look at the, my God, look at this. That's like a veil black diamond right there. Um, that's what they call like devil's cross when you're at a ski <laughs> resort or something like that, or, you know, Satan's satanic hill. Uh, so you went down there, but then the bounce back. Um, and then, you know, it's been very, very choppy, but here we are, um, you know, looking pretty good here, or at least say two thirds or three quarters of the way back um, as at least as of last month uh, in terms of the market. Yeah, and I think we're gonna con we're gonna continue to see REITs just stabilize a bit more. It's you know it was just it was such a weird year for real estate because and and this this isn't a sort of thing that happens because that because this was mostly due to closures. So I believe that even if we have you know we're never gonna have the same thing twice. But even if we do have another pandemic and another series of closures, we're not gonna see this type of situation happen the same way because it won't be as much of a shock they'll mm -hmm. you know it'll be a very different situation so i feel like this this really shows you know kind of th that we made it out of it i mean sometimes i just want to pat us all on the back you know we're, <laughs> we're we're making it through it's been you know it's been a really challenging time absolutely um it, it, real estate has if you think about it it's, it's unbelievable in the last 15 years real estate has had two incredible um, volatile, volatility events, you know, really depression like events, you know, um, with the, the global financial crisis and what that had for real estate, um, just, you know, the commercial financing and everything that happened around that. And then, of course, last year and still going on, which is the pandemic, which had a very acute effect on real estate as the asset class in particular. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And yet, you know, here we are. And, and I talked to people back in the financial crisis and, you know, there was, Back then, they were saying, "Oh, well, real estate's changed forever. You know, you're never going to see cap rates go down again. You're never going to see people pay this square foot for apartments again or our hospitality again." And guess what? A few years after the financial crisis, everything was at record highs again. You know, uh, and then partly partly due to low interest rates, which have been very accommodative throughout the time. But um, everything in the moment looks really awful, and everything in the moment a year ago uh, looked awful, right? And I think you had a lot of people who were just, were just like this, it's going to change things forever. And there are, there will be some things that change, but I, I'm, as we've talked about, I think by sort of the second half of this year, hopefully, uh, I think things are going to be back to a much more normal than people might expect. The, the funny thing is the surprise is going to probably be on how normal things might be in six months versus what we think about today. Right. Which is like, ah, things are, things are getting back, but gosh, it's hard to imagine them getting back to normal, but uh, just, I mean, we talked a little while ago about just the, the amount of people flying again, you know, uh, which is extraordinary. And as soon as these events come back, like Comic-Con or other events and these big uh, conferences, people are going to, people are going to go back and, and resorts are going to get fully back opened and people are going to go on, go back to concerts. The new normal might just be the surprise. It might be, it might be surprising how normal things are uh, in, in just some time from now. Well, this slide I wanted to bring up, uh, we've got a comment that fits perfectly. Uh, Max says, what do you think about people investing in real estate, given that if you own a home, most of your net worth is already in real estate? So this, this you shared this on Twitter the other day, and, and I found it just, I'm like, this is such a great illustration of the value of real estate. Yeah, it's, uh, this is, um, Visual Capitalist put this together a couple of years mm -hmm. back, and um, I like it. It's, you know, yeah, so to Max's point, you know, if you own a home and like you're thinking to yourself, real estate, well, there you go. Like 70% of my assets might be in my home. And so that is my real estate investment. So I'm, I'm invested in real estate. Well, you know, like I've tended to push back on that. Um, I, I tend to think your, your principal residence is not 
doesn't usually equal real estate investing. To me, real estate investing is, uh, you know, investing in REITs or, or private, you know, maybe private real estate equities or investing in a rental property, uh, investing in commercial properties where you're, you're, you're looking at a risk asset and you're looking to make decisions for that asset for a profit, you know, a profit motive, right? We don't really do that with our homes. We, we look at our homes and think, oh, okay, well, this is a great place to live. Uh, so my kids can grow up and, and they, they have access to nice schools or playgrounds. And, um, and I'm, making, I'm often making decisions about my principal residence that I wouldn't make about a, a rental property or a commercial property I'm invested in. So, uh, so what's fascinating about this chart is, where, what, is what, are, what are people's journeys, right? So most of my assets, if I'm in the, uh, you know, the middle income net worth area, yeah, 60, 62% on average is, is in my principal residence. But that, that declines dramatically um, as you sort of scale up in your net worth to the point where when you're in the ultra rich category, which hopefully all of us can get to someday, but you know, sort of the top 1%, the primary residence is less than 10% of the assets. More, actually, the plurality of assets, almost 50%, is in business equity and other real estate. So real estate investments, you know, that, those could be uh, vacation homes. They could be commercial properties that you own or, you know, equity in office buildings or um, part, limited partnerships that invest in real estate, things like that, um, or private equity. So again, well, what, what's also fascinating maybe to a lot of viewers too, is that the proportion of the stocks um, and, you know, liquid security sort of is actually qu is lower than you might think for the ultra rich. Like we tend to think, oh, well, stock market, that's how people get rich and, and the rich people must own, you know, billions of dollars worth of stocks. Well, they do, but as a proportion of their net worth, it's actually less than it is for other real estate and private equity, which I think is, I think is quite fascinating about this. Well, and I think part of that too, uh, I know we're not going to talk taxes this time, but I think part of the reason that you see that with the ultra rich is that they are, they are, you know, more, more tax sensitive than, than any other humans, I think. <laughs> and so I, I feel like that's a part of it too, is that's one reason that you see them uh, looking at real estate as, as a way to build wealth and, and maintain it. And, and save on those taxes. Exactly. All right. So I love this because this is, now we're talking about, okay, so what are the parts of the real estate market that I, I should be focused on if I'm thinking, um, you know, diversifying my portfolio, and, but I'm looking to do that maybe in, in places that aren't going to experience a lot of volatility, Deidre. Um, and so these are three areas that you kind of highlighted for investors. These are three areas that we saw do do well during the pandemic. I mean, we've already talked about industrial, the need uh, for space, a billion square feet by 2025. Oh, that's uh, it's like it's, huge. it's what is and there's another number that I think we've quoted before, which is like four million square feet for like returns alone. Four hundred I mean, million. Yeah, four hundred million. Yeah, CBRE yeah. yeah, that it, yeah, four hundred million square feet of of, of warehouse just for it to handle returns. Since so many people are buying on shopping online, there's not enough warehouse space to handle returns, which is incredible. It's an incredible figure. Right. I mean, they're, they're turning, I read an article in Business Week the other day, they're turning golf courses into Amazon fulfillment centers in some areas. Oh my gosh. I mean, the, the about the, the need for space is just out of control. And industrial isn't, uh, you know, price per square foot in industrial traditionally didn't, didn't move too much. I believe it was up about 4% last year, which, which for industrial is like really big in, yeah. in, from what I've seen in the past. Big time. And it should, uh, you know, in my view, in a lot of markets, it should be growing a lot higher because about the space that you need to build an effective, you know, warehouse or distribution facility, it's not, it's not a, a you know, a half acre where I can, you know, put a, uh, an office building with a small parking lot. No, no, no. I, I need, I need tens of thousands of square feet of space uh, to build uh, any kind of warehouse that's going to serve, say, a FedEx or an Amazon or an XBO or any sort of the big log companies that need logistics. Uh, so, I mean, these are huge, huge uh, facilities, thousands of square feet. Um, and gosh, trying to buy that amount of land uh, or that amount of development space in tight markets, like think, you know, gosh, think about trying to do that in Boston or New York City or uh, nowadays even Austin, Texas. It's, it's really expensive to do that. Uh, and so I, I got to believe just to justify the development that's going to go in, you're going to have to see that rent per square foot um, per industrial go up a lot higher. Absolutely. And so the next section, uh, communications and data centers, uh, 
we all used a lot more data uh, during the pandemic. Everybody's zooming from home. Uh, 5G, and then also the you know the the government now is you know really wants to roll out broadband. You know the Biden administration has talked about that. That's a priority. They see that as really important in in rural areas and places where there where there aren't we, you know we saw it this year uh, one of the concerns is education right uh in you know kids that couldn't go to school and then di didn't have access to the internet they're like completely cut off so we're seeing just that need and that is driving a lot more interest in in both uh data centers and uh communication towers right and and to the second bullet there will some 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 companies go in house yeah i mean What's that fascinating? Big Google deal, right? Well, there, there's that, and then there's you know what, what you, you can look at the telecoms. A lot of telecoms spent the last decade divesting their towers. Now they're like, ah, oh, we need to get those back. <laughs> they're much more valuable than we thought, and we want to control them. You know, and so um, that's that's something you could see as well. So the you know the towers did really well, sort of acquiring those assets for now. Now it looks like great prices as many many years ago, um, and now uh, you know. The equipment that's needed, the, the 5G rollout, uh, it's just like it's it's now very expensive now for a lot of these telecom companies to lease these properties, which uh, especially some of the small cell stuff that like Crown Castles, you know, with the urban uh, in the urban zones. I mean, it's it's not cheap. And so you could see a lot of telecom companies pulling those back in uh, as well. But certainly, yeah, on the data center side as well, it's it's, it's what, what is more cost effective outsourcing that leasing it or you know, doing it in house for a lot for a long time, especially like sort of post.com, it was like, do it in house. And then for the last 10 or 15 years, it was like, no, no, let's lease all that stuff. It's a lot cheaper. Uh, and, you know, let's essentially effectively make the cloud. And now, now it's like, no, no, let's bring it all back in. <laughs> well, no, I think I think we're reaching a little bit of a hybrid. I mean, if I look at what like what Amazon is doing, and even the Google with that seven billion dollars, Google still has plenty of data in data centers uh, with with other companies all around. So I think that's what you see now is these big companies are being like, okay, we're going to own some, we're going to lease some space, we're going to kind of divide it up a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. There's, there's, of course, there's always ways to do it. And, and the, good, the good companies that allocate capital well will figure out the right way to, to use or divest assets. Uh, nice. So, all right. Finally, multifamily. What are we looking at here? What, what aren't we looking at? I mean, yeah, we've, got, we we've, got, we've, <laughs> we've got growing population. We've got uh, housing prices that are insane. A lot of people just cannot get into the market. Uh, even, you know, uh, exist, single family homes are higher priced usually than condos, but even condos are going up to the point where a lot of people can't get in. So increased need for, for multifamily. I think we're going to see a lot of household formation. Everybody that like maybe moved back home or moved in, we're going to see that household formation come back, you know, uh, as the job market improves over the next year or two. I'm also looking at single family build to rent. We've saw, seen some of the home builders do it uh, yeah. in, in big communities. DR Horton has sold a community. Lennar is doing that spinoff uh, for single family rentals. I'm looking at that. And I'm also looking at, at mobile homes a lot. You know, I'm starting Blackstone. I know is investing a lot in mobile homes and the more, you know, I've interviewed a few people on, on the million acres podcast, and there's a lot of interest starting to grow about, about mobile home communities, which is really kind of interesting because I think there's a lot to, there's, there's some concerns there. There are certainly some ethical concerns, but there's also a need for housing, a need for housing to be fast. And it does kind of solve some of those issues. Ah, well, wait, yeah. The last slide we have, I'm glad you brought up the, the sort of mobile home RV community. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, in, there's a way you can invest in that pretty effectively. And we'll talk about that in a sec, but to that bullet about the, yeah, the single family rentals, uh, we, uh, last summer in our mogul service, we invested in a, a private deal that was going to, um, develop, um, I think it's in multiple stages, but it's ultimately going to develop 300 uh, single family rental houses right outside Huntsville, Alabama, which, by the way, is a pretty hot market and for a lot of reasons. But you're seeing this more and more. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's a very uh, I mean, the demand is there. And if you can and, and yet if you think about where we are post pandemic, right, a lot of people can't afford to buy homes, especially in hot markets, but they can't afford to rent. And so if I can rent a single family home, I'm not sharing a wall or floors with anyone. And I, maybe I have a little yard and uh, that's, that can be a lot, that can be pretty appealing. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm raising a family, so I need a little more space. Uh, and that's not something that's existed for a long time. You either had sort of your single family 
home purchase market, or you had your apartment communities or your garden style apartments and things like that. And so the SFR trend's a big one. Uh, I think that's really taking off in a lot of places. And uh, yeah, I'm not surprised that Blackstone and others are getting into it because there's, there's certainly demand and it's in a lot of ways, a lot cheaper than building um, and faster than building sort of your typical high rise apartment building or other complex. Now, so we talked about some of the good places in the market. Oh, let's talk about some of the more volatile parts of the market and probably no surprises here, right, Deidre? <laughs> yeah, I mean, hotel, hotel REITs, it's not a surprise. You know, we saw the numbers last year, the, the revenue per available room numbers, the, the occupancy rates all just down to historic lows. But from now looking forward, that the uh, CMBS commercial mortgage-backed security uh, debt is a concern in the hospitality market. We've talked about that before. It's it's still mm. really high. Yeah. The thing is, there's there's a lot of dry powder on the sidelines right now. Distressed asset funds lo- kind of looking to pounce on that. We've seen a couple of of deals happen so far, but not not a lot considering, you know, considering what could happen. So it's. It, it is a little risky there, but you know we're seeing some things come back. You and I have talked about Ryman Hospitality Group before, and they're starting to see people booking conventions and things like that. So I would say it's it's getting less risky, but it's still pretty risky. What do you think? Yeah, I I, I think it's it's the, the future is getting a little less cloudy, and you're seeing a lot of institutional money come in and and buy private equity and buy out a lot of uh, you know a lot of assets, thinking that hey you know I'm I'm, I'm there's a lot of stress here I'm dealing in a, a situation where there's a lot of forced sellers I can go in and, and buy hopefully for cents on the dollar and then you know maybe a year from now or two years from now the markets bounce back average daily rates are back occupancies back and I can. Re- these into the public markets or to other buyers um, at, at fairly good, fairly healthy prices. Yeah, no doubt. There, there's going to be a lot of money made in in the hotel space. My my problem is now for when it comes to REITs. So when it comes to for, for the retail investor looking for opportunities, uh, it's a little it's a little dicier. And and mm-hmm. we I tend to land on Ryman, like you said, or or even Avail Resorts because and Vail, by the way, is not distressed at all. It's pretty much back at all time highs, if not at new all time highs, but Situations where there's just a, uh, a naturally captive audience for your hotels, unique assets, um, y- you know, uh, a, a nice mix of sort of corporate, but also, you know, casual uh, tourism and visiting and visitors. And it's when you can do that, you can marry all that together. I think you can find some good opportunities. Buying your typical hospitality hotel REIT right now. Ugh, you know, there's there's still a lot to slog through right here. And I think you could, like I said, I think you can do better with some of the stronger parts of the market, even though they're up, which is like industrial uh, on a risk war basis, you can probably do a lot, lot better. Right. I think another factor is that we might see a little bit of a, uh, in terms of travel, a bump this year that may not, may not last long, partly because a lot of people are going to be vaccinated. A lot of people are gonna, may be able to travel, but they're not going to travel internationally. Mm, Probably not this year. So you've got you've, you kind of got a bit of a U.S. captive audience, but but so you might see a bump, but that bump may not last uh, long term. Yeah, that, no, that's an interesting point. Uh, okay, we, and we got retail. Uh, gosh, uh, even before COVID, we knew mm-hmm. this, Deidre. There was just trouble. Um, U.S. is yeah. I think it's fair to say the U.S. is still over retailed. Still too much square footage. I mean, that's, you know, even before COVID, we were seeing the transformation of a lot of real estate into either sort of mixed use or, you know, (laughs) data center or warehouse space. Um, And that's, I feel like all the pandemic did was accelerate a lot of that. Uh, And, you know, so much has gone online. And so (sighs) talk about murky, right? What is the future of sort of traditional retail? It's, it's, I don't know if the clouds have dissipated so much there. Um, I, I do think there are probably situations where, uh, you know, your EPRs of the world or your Seratages, even your Simon property, maybe where you have an opportunity to build, um, you know, experiential or other uh, reasons for tenants and customers to come to your property versus instead of just coming to shop. Uh, and that, that could be an opportunity, but still very, very cloudy to me. 
Yeah, experiential is really fascinating. Uh, for example, like uh, there was a story on Million Acres recently, uh, Dick Sporting Goods. They're putting in rock walls in some of their stores, so they're get they're yeah. betting on that on, on that return of experiential. Which bef before the pandemic, all we heard about was experiential. You know, Simon had that group with Allied to do esports. Everyone was going to come to the mall to do all these interesting things, and then pandemic hits and nobody could actually go to the mall. Yes. Right. But that's you're right. And those trends should be still intact. So now it's just a matter of vaccination and, and people being able to get out there. And uh, once that's the place, I, I, I think those places, will, uh, those things will do it. You, you and I, you know, it's funny, you and I are both from Massachusetts. Oh, and I, I'm trying to think, what is that furniture company up there in Massachusetts? Do you remember? It's uh, the two brothers. Funny oh, Jordan's, commercial. Jordan's Furniture? Yes, jo Jordan's Furniture, right. So I, I remember over the last 20 years, all the Jordan's Furniture outlets, which very popular sort of furniture outlet store brand. Um, you know, they converted all their spaces into like, you know, yeah, like rock wall climbing or trapeze or, you know, they added IMAX theaters. And so it became like this huge test and restaurants like Fuddruckers would, you know, so you'd go and it's, it's, I'm going there to hang out for the day because I can, yeah, I can shop for furniture. I can shop for electronics, but I can also, my kid can go play on the trapeze or do other things. Uh, we can go see a movie later in the afternoon. Uh, we can go bowling. It's like, it became like these big event centers. So I feel like that, that's still out there, uh, you know, and it's just a matter of, you know, coming, you know, people being uh, comfortable going out to those places again. And I think they will. So anyway, funny, funny anecdote from back home. Probably too late for the uh, American Dream Mall, though. I don't know if you've been uh, that the whole uh, triple <laughs> five group that that whole thing seems to uh, I believe part of mall of the Mall of America is now going back to the uh, going back to the bank because of because of all of that debt. So ouch might might be a little late for that one. Yeah. And we'll talk about office quickly because I do want to get to the last slide. But uh, yes. wow. What? Yeah. Perfect way to put it. It's a wild card with office. Um, I think it's just gonna be different. Companies are going to do things all companies are going to do things differently, right? Whether it's hybrid models, whether it's on and off days, it's, you know, it's going to be just fascinating. I think every company is going to make its own decision. I wouldn't read too much in this one survey that says 80% of workers want to go back to the office or another survey that says only 20%. Like it depends So on many the... surveys. Oh, too many <laughs> surveys. I'm always surveyed when it comes to office because, and because honestly, it's, 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 a, it's market specific. It's company specific. It's all going to balance out at some point. I think you and I both agree a certain percentage of workers are going to work from home a lot or even most of the time. And that's just going to be the reality. But will it be, you know, is the need for office space going to completely go away? I don't think so. Um, it's going to be used differently, maybe, and maybe less in, in different frequency, but it's not going away. All right, let's go to this last slide here, which, um, whoa, oh, sorry. Oops, I put it <laughs> Two You've slides. Got, go, we'll yeah, go, let's let's hit this one real quick. This one quickly. Uh, so yeah, this is just a little bit of thinking about uh, the sort of old standards in stock, the bellwethers, like like a prologist for industrial versus the the upstarts, one that might be newer. So there's yeah. some pros and cons to each. You know, you're looking for that track record, but with an upstart, there's more growth. So as you think about volatility, you want to have that mix of kind of bellwethers and upstarts, I think, as you build a portfolio. Yeah, exactly. And what we talked about way at the beginning in the first couple of slides, which is, you know, your bellwether is obviously going to be much less volatile. Um, and so your opportunity to build good geometric compounding returns over time with your portfolio, you know, it's going to come from having a good stable base of bellwethers, as you put it. And then, yeah, you want to have the upstarts though, too, because ultimately returns matter the most, volatility plays a role. And so, you know, uh, you certainly want to try to swing for the fences with at least part of your portfolio, because my goodness, the difference it'll make to your returns over time will be massive. All right. So speaking of boring and bellwether, if we go to the last slide here. So these are just a quick list. I know we don't have much time of what I call low vol ideas. So, and they're all real estate companies. And so if you're interested in uh, investments where there's really low volatility, um, forgetting for a fact that 2020 happened, but just looking over, say, the last decade, um, you know, these are companies that have demonstrated very little volatility and their business models are also sort of very, I hate to say it, but boring, right? Um, Easterly Government Properties is probably the boringest of the boring here. Um, it is uh, exclusively focused on federal, federally leased properties. So think of like um, an FBI building or uh, a FEMA building, or a, a Veterans Affairs building, which is one of their big ones, right? Uh, th that's their entire portfolio. They've got about 80 properties. They're all fed on long-term federal leases. And so 
the good thing about Uncle Sam, he never defaults yet. <laughs> and so Easterly always gets their rent um, paid in full and on time, full backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, as we like to say. So really boring read, but a good track record since they went public. Uh, gosh, I believe it was seven, six or seven years ago. Uh, you know, it's earned about it's generated about 11 percent annual return. Pretty good for about a boring as business and stable as business as you can find. Uh, life storage. We talked about self storage. This is probably my favorite self storage business. Uh, it's self storage is a great business. Uh, you know, one of the things about self storage is that you can you can pretty much break even with the self storage facility at about sixty percent occupancy. Um, no other real real you know real estate asset class can really say that. Um, NVR. Look at the long term chart of NVR. Very few ups and downs, but steady steady winner over time. One of the you know the track record is amazing. Uh, PS Business Parks. Um, company I've been looking at recently, they are mostly industrial slash flex office, big flex office player. Flex office is very, uh, tends to be a very stable business in demand in a lot of markets. Uh, safe hold. I mean, look at that name, Steve, you're safe. safe. That's the ticker, safe. <laughs> I mean, how could you go wrong? How could it be, how could it be volatile? It's safe. One, their entire business model is based on going to a uh, commercial property owner, buying the land and leasing it back on a super long-term lease, like 50-year lease, 99-year lease um, back to the, the property owner. So you know, the nice thing is the property owner gets a nice boatload of cash. Um, and in, in return, Safehold gets a nice 99-year lease on the land. Think about that. <laughs> it can't be any more safer and stable and sleepier than that. Uh, and then Stag Industrial, I just put that up here because I love Stag Industrial. And even the name Stag, it stagnates over time. Low volatile, <laughs> right? And then Deidre, I'm so glad you mentioned sort of the RV homes, mobile home market earlier because Sun Communities, I believe, is the biggest owner of uh, mobile home parks in the United States. Um, and this, again, is a business where they understand the economics of that business really well. They, they dominate in all their markets. Uh, and this is just, you know, sort of a rising, for especially people looking for more affordable ho- housing options. Um, and Sun Communities has char- you know, carved out this really nice niche within uh, the multifamily space. So there you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, really boring, low volatile idea, low vol ideas. But um, all these businesses have, have great track records. If you look at, you know, depending on when you invested, but for the most part, uh, you've done really well by investing in a lot of these businesses. All right, I will stop sharing my screen. That was a lot of stuff we threw out people today. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it was. I was already at the end of time. Wow. It was great. Yeah, no, so many good ideas. Uh, let's see, anything with our last couple of minutes here. Uh, question from Retired Fool. Did dividend stocks minimize the disadvantages of high volatility? Do they minimize the disadvantages? Yeah, I would say because for a, for a business that's generally a dividend payer, especially in the REIT space, you know, you're, 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 you're taking a certain a significant percentage of your net income or your pre-tax profits, and you're setting it aside for your, your dividend. Um, and most companies recognize that their shareholder base generally is looking, investing in them for that dividend. And so naturally, they're allocating capital to, um, to pay that dividend, right or wrong, um, but that tends to lend to stability, right? So you're looking at businesses with, again, if you're a real estate business, long-term leases or stable cash flows, they have the ability to pay that that dividend over time. And that's some of the, one of the things they focus on. So naturally it creates, it adds stability to the business. Excellent. Uh, let's see. One question from Lori. If communication towers will be important in the future, why has AMT done so poorly in the past couple of years? Well, there's a bunch of reasons for that. You can look at CCI as well. It's, it's also underperformed. Um, there's been a consolidation a little bit in the telecom space. You saw that with uh, T-Mobile and Sprint, which was fi- finally allowed to merge last year or earlier this year. I can't remember. It's been so. It's been happening so long. I can't remember when they actually happened. But uh, so that what that what happens then is then you have a lot of telecom companies who don't have to double up on towers anymore, so they can sort of consolidate their assets within towers. That's part of the reason. Um, there's also um, the 5G rollout, which a lot of people got excited about early on with these towers. I mean, if you look at the, the returns over the last decade, it's been phenomenal because people have been anticipating this sort of next gen rollout of new assets on these towers. Um, and that's, it's coming. It's just not coming as fast. And I think a lot of these com- stocks, especially AMT got way ahead of themselves probably. And so they're just pulling back a little bit, but um, gosh, the long-term picture in my view, couldn't, couldn't be brighter for these, for these companies, especially now with the telecom companies wishing they still had these assets and now trying to get them <laughs> back. So Exactly. Perfect. Well, we are at time. Thank you so much, Matt.